I finally have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Carmen Rasmussen and Dr. Jacqueline Pye, who are joining us again for the second in a three-part series on cognitive interventions to improve skills in individuals with FASD. Dr. Pai is a registered psychologist specializing in neuropsychological assessment. She is also an assistant professor in educational psychology and assistant clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta. Dr. Rasmussen is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and member of the Center for Neuroscience at the University of Alberta. She is also a research affiliate at the Glenrose Rehabilitation Hospital. Please join me in welcoming Jackie and Carmen. Welcome. Thanks, Colleen. It's a pleasure to be here today and, and welcome to everyone. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, memory skills and um, we're going to do a little bit of pick up where we left off um, in our last session, but I'll review things for folks who weren't with us. Um, but before we do anything, I want to start just by grounding us in memory a little bit. So before we even get going, I, I have this quote here and um, it's on your handout as well. I'm just going to read it for a minute. Memory is perhaps the most central aspect of human thought. Any question about human behavior, cognition, develop, uh, development, and nature requires an understanding of memory. Our memory makes us who we are and it is one of the most intimate parts of ourselves. I love that quote because I think it speaks to how pervasive the issue of memory is. We think of memory sometimes as this tape recorder in our head and as we talk about memory today, we're going to talk a little bit about the tape recorder in our head, but I also want to talk a little bit bigger. And when we start thinking about the functional implications, what you're going to see day to day as a result of memory, we're thinking about issues at this big level. I mean, memory is crucial to who a person is. If I ask you to tell me about yourself, you're probably going to tell me about things that you've done or things that you've experienced or something about what you remember of your life, what you remember and think of yourself. So your very definition, your very sense of yourself is in some degree defined by memory. So as we think about memory and as we ponder what a memory deficit means for somebody in day-to-day -day living, um, this is kind of the definition I start with. And that doesn't mean I'm not going to talk about the tape recorder and basic learning and things like that. But I'm also going to go beyond that and, and towards the end of the session as we talk about strategies. And, and if I, as I throughout encourage you to think about the behavioral implica implications of a memory deficit, this is the definition that I'm working from. So we're thinking whole person here, not just the tape recorder. So I wanted to start with that because I'm very passionate about the topic of memory. It's one of my favorite things. And it's this idea of memory as really being part of who we are that, that gets me excited about it. So when we're thinking about this and we're thinking about FASD, we're thinking about this really core component of what who we are. So having laid that groundwork and getting my real excitement over with there and, and, and letting you all know that I'm a memory geek, um, I'm going to go down to session goals now and get us organized a little bit as to what we're going to do today. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about evidence-based intervention in your role. And this is where we're going to review very briefly some of the things that we did in our last session on language. So some of this will be review for some of you and others it might be new. So I just want to kind of bring us all up to speed very quickly. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about memory impairments in FASD or just memory in general in FASD. An individual, what, what you might see and what that might look like for you. Then we're going to talk about research into memory interventions, both specific to the FASD population as well as other populations. Because, like um, we've said before when we talk about interventions and like we talked about in our last session, there's very, very little intervention research that's been done into this area. So what we're starting to do is to dip into other areas to try to inform us a little bit more. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about what does this mean for us in practice? What can it start to mean and where do we go forward from here? So gives you an idea of what to expect. So, into the review portion of, of our session here, when we talk about research into intervention, we're talking about three key things. We're talking about research efficacy. Does it work in the lab? Meaning, can I do a study in the lab in a controlled condition in a quiet, perfect little room and have it work? Is it meaningfully effective? Meaning, once you move that into a classroom, does it still work? 
It's one thing to get it to work in a quiet little lab, it's another thing to get it to work in a classroom. And the third question that we ask is, is it feasible? Can you afford it? So if I can get a memory strategy to work, let's say, uh, you know, um, I'm doing a chunking strategy, I'm, I'm putting information together in a nice quiet little room. So I have a child with an FASD and they're able to chunk things together. Oh, those are all animals and those are all things you put in a house. Okay, I, I've got that. But then I put them in a classroom where there's multiple distractions. Are they still going to be able to chunk? They could do it in a lab, but the, can they do it in the classroom where we suddenly create a distraction environment? Or let's say that my chunking strategy, and here I'm testing my own creativity, but let's say it is accompanied by oodles of technology. We have some headset that we put on the kids that has some zingy, zangy little technology attached to it that allows them to do the chunking. And it costs a million bucks each then it may not be particularly feasible to bring it in the classroom. So it may work beautifully in the classroom because they put their cool headset on and there's no distraction, but we can't afford to buy that for every kid. So it's no longer feasible in terms of our ability to get resources. So I want to know if it works. I want to know if it works in the real world and I want to know if we can really do it. Do we have the resources to do it? When we think about intervention, those are the three biggies that we always come back to. As I said earlier, and as we'll keep saying, and, and it will sound you know, very repetitive after a while, the evidence in terms of practice for interventions with individuals with an FASD is still emerging. In terms of what we've compiled and what we've found as researchers, it's very, very little. There are very few research studies that tell us this is the evidence. There's very little that tells us that e research efficacy this works in the lab. Like a handful of studies. And you'll hear today, that I think we're reviewing one. And Carmen's going to talk to you a little bit about that. But that's it. That's all we have in terms of what works in the lab. Very, very little. So, wow, you say, so what are you guys going to talk about for the next little while? Well, it's not the only source of information. And part of what we're doing is dipping into other research. But the other thing we want to talk about is where else that information can come from. And that's where you guys all have a role. And that's where you all have a responsibility. Because to some degree, you may already have an idea of what's effective. You may already know what's kind of working in a classroom or what's working in a real world, what's feasible in the real world. So information can move in both directions. Some information can come from the real world and influence the way that research goes. And we can say, oh yeah, that's, there's effica that's efficacious. Yeah, what they're doing really works. And we can promote that and we can talk about it. But we need a system to do that. We need a way to make sure that there's a, a communication around what is working in the classroom and how do we capture that? Or what is working in that home environment? And how do we capture that? So one of the things that I introduced in our last session was this invest model, investing in your intervention. I'm not going to go through each point again, so don't panic, those of you who were here last month, because that feels like it's a lot of repeat. But just for the new folks, um, <coughs> INVEST is talking about sort of six steps when you're doing an intervention. And, and they're not necessarily um, really heavy time components. What you want to do is identify your problem or your goals, and we're going to talk about that today. Even when I talk to you a little bit about what's going on in memory with individuals with an FASD, we're talking about identifying a problem or identifying what a goal might look like. What are we trying to accomplish in this intervention? Why are we doing it? What are our indicators of success? How will I know that what I'm doing is working? A lot of you do this every day in practice. You say, oh, I want this to improve, and this is how I'll know. But do you write it down? Or do you track it? Or do you take a couple of minutes to make a note of it? Do we validate our assumptions? Am I sure that this behavior I'm seeing is because of a memory problem? And as we talk, we're going to kind of think about how behavior and memory are linked. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Then you do an intervention. You put it into place. Then you look at your outcomes. Did, did I achieve what I was hoping to? Were those goals achieved? Yes, they were. Great. There is some evidence of a successful intervention right there in practice. I did these steps. I looked at my outcomes and it worked. Or it only kind of worked. What can I tweak? What can I change to make it better? Moves me into my last stage of tweak and transfer where I tweak it, change it up a little bit, and then I share that information with other folks. And that's why writing it down, making some notes, communicating and sharing with other people becomes a crucial part of what we do. Because otherwise, we could have a lot of people doing great work, but we're never communicating that work and bringing it together and beginning to say, here's best practices. 
If we wait to hear from the researchers what the best interventions are, you'll be waiting a long time. You'll be waiting a long time. So what we need to do is move that communication in two directions so that we can also reflect back what you guys already know is working and how you know it's working and help support that process of documenting it and, and, and measuring that and reporting it. So there's my your role in this whole process a little bit and, and that's all I'll say for a repeat. If others have more questions or they want to hear a bit more about that, you're more than welcome to contact me via emails as you already heard as, as a way to ask questions. But I won't repeat any more than that. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about memory in FASD and, and what memory looks like and some of the things that we've seen. As I talk about memory, we're going to think about, you know, identifying the problems. We're going to think about how you would look at success and how you would validate assumptions. So those three pieces, as I talk about memory and even later on when I talk about strategies, have those in the back of your mind. And as we talk about some of the things that you might see in terms of memory, ask yourself, what would this look like behaviorally? So if somebody has this kind of memory problem, what might I see? What might it look like? Because we don't see memory, right? We don't, it's not like something like, oh, they're acting on memory right now. But we still act behaviorally when something's going on in our memory. So what might I see? When could a memory issue be an underlying problem? So if I've got a child, let's say in a classroom, who's behaving a certain way, when might that behavior be reflecting something to do with memory? And finally, if memory is the problem, how might that assumption impact the goals I set? So if I think this child is acting out in the classroom, they're starting to toss things around, like they're going crazy, and I actually think it's about memory because I think that they couldn't remember the, the instructions I gave the class. So I said we need to do this, and then we need to do this, and need to do this. And they only got item one. And that was because their memory didn't allow them to get item two and three. So now they don't know what to do. So now they're starting to toss things around because they're bored and they're confused and they don't know what to do. So if I think to myself, no, no, it's not just that they're disruptive and they're trying to you know give me a headache today it's because they didn't hear my instructions then what goal am I going to set and how will that then change my intervention okay I'm going to write out the instructions on a board or I'm going to do things differently and the goal is to see a reduction in that acting out behavior when they're supposed to be following directions so this is what I'm going to do. So these are the questions I kind of want you to keep at the back of your mind. So keep flipping back in your handout if you forget. Because even as you think about uh, what the implications of memory function is for you in the classroom, for you in a home environment, or any other environment, these, these are what's going to start grounding it to function, grounding it to behavior. So I'm going to start by talking about, uh, when we talk about memory, um, verbal memory and I'll talk about visual memory. And when we're talking about these two, these are sort of our two big bodies of memory literature, I guess. And they sit more in our thinking about memory as this idea of a tape recorder or something where we're getting information in, right? It's being recorded. When we talk about verbal memory and visual memory, we're thinking about things like, can you learn it? Does it get into your head? Can you retain it? Like, does it stay in your head? And can you recall it? Can you then get it out of your head when you want it out? Those are the basic verbal, visual kind of memory questions we ask or things that we think about when we're looking at, at that, those aspects of memory. So what do we see um, with individuals within FASD when it comes to the verbal memory? So usually verbal memory means it's language based and typically with verbal memory we're also talking auditory. So it's something you're hearing and it's based in language. One of the biggest conclusions that comes out over and over again, it's one of the rare places where there actually seems to be a lot of agreement in the literature around FASD, and really there's not always a lot of agreement. One of the rare places is that learning, the ability to get that information in, is the most significant place of impairment in terms of verbal memory and even memory overall. So the greatest difficulty for these individuals is getting that information in, is learning that information in. Once it's in, once it's learned, there appears to be better retention and better recall of that information. So what is learned, which is going to be less information because it's a lot harder to learn, so they're not going to get as much as others, but once it's in, it does seem to be retained, held onto, and, and can be recalled. Now we'll talk about a few other things that impact that. 
One of them is um, that it's not always well organized. So you see that I've written there intrusion or perseverative errors. Terrible wording. I'm, you know, what, what does that mean? So an intrusion error means that I get this information. So I got a little bit in, and now you're asking me to recall it. You're asking me to remember it. But I'm remember, and I'm remembering, and I'm remembering some of it. But I'm also remembering a whole lot more. So I'm pouring out a lot of extra information. That's an intrusion error. That means I'm not just giving you what you wanted re me to remember, but I'm also giving you extra information. So it's not particularly accurate. A perseverative error means I may give the same information over and over and over again. So what did you do yesterday? Well, I went to the store and I walked down the street and then when I went to the store, I went into the store. And once I was at the store, I, you know, was thinking about how I went to the store and, you know, stories, and if you actually stop to listen to the story, you're like, okay, really, I have no idea what you did except something to do with a store because you keep talking about the store over and over and over again. That would be an example of sort of that perseverative. It kind of gets stuck and you kind of retell the same part of the story over and over again. Um, we talked a little bit a month ago about language and we talked about how sometimes kids um, with an FASD have language issues and that has a real impact in terms of verbal memory, right? Because if you need language to learn or if, you, you know, if, if we're learning via language, then if you have difficulties in language, that's going to affect your ability to learn. If you don't understand something, it's harder to learn it because then all you're doing is rote recall. You're recalling the word-for-word -word sentence. There's no deeper understanding. So if you have weak language skills, it will affect your memory. On the flip side, when you have memory issues, it's going to affect your language skills. So it's a two-way street. So for example, if my memory isn't very good, and again, a month ago we talked about language and we talked about how sometimes kids with an FASD can talk a whole lot without really saying anything. Right? And if you stop to really listen, you're going, okay, I'm actually not sure where this story is going, but when I've got 30 other kids around me, I'm, not, I'm just noticing there's a lot of talk. That can reflect a language issue like we discussed a month ago, but it can also reflect memory. And it can reflect these kind of perseverative or intrusive type errors where my story doesn't make a whole lot of sense and things start to flow together, not necessarily just because of language, but also because my memory of those things is a little bit scattered. And my ability to bring that information out, it's all in there, but my ability to bring it out in an organized way is a little bit muddled. And so you're getting little bits of extra stories and extra pieces, and I'm repeating some over and over and over again to fill the gaps where my memory isn't working for me. I sometimes think about it or I compare it to having a filing cabinet. So when we're dealing with verbal memory with FISD, um, less stuff is getting into the filing cabinet to begin with. So we put information on our filing cabinet in our brains. Okay, so less stuff's getting in there. And then what's getting in there is staying in there. And can, we can get it out okay, but they're not using a really good filing system. So the file folders aren't great. There may be a file folder up there, you know, a birthday party file folder may be in there, but it may not separate all the birthday parties out. And so you end up with a whole lot of information kind of jammed in there. So even though they're able to recall it, and when we do tests in a lab setting, we get lovely recall because we're mostly measuring, can you get this? The fact that you get all these extra words doesn't matter as much as the fact that in our lab setting, you're able to get the, the words or the story that we want you to get. In real life, the fact that you've told a story that has a little bit to do with the birthday party or this weekend as well as every other birthday party you've been at for the last year, what would that look like? Well, here's Johnny and he's in grade four and he's telling everybody that, oh yeah, I was at this birthday party on the weekend and I played laser tag and I killed like everybody and kids are all like, no, I was at that birthday party too and we didn't play laser tag. We, you know, went to the jungle gym. I don't know, we went somewhere else. Well, no, we did laser tag because there's the memory, right? And so I pulled out of my birthday party file folder, but the wrong stuff came out, right? What's that gonna mean for a kid in school? Oh, you liar, oh, you're... And we're gonna talk a little bit more about these kinds of mistakes, but what we see is we see this in verbal memory. We see these kind of errors. So even though the material does seem to be stored in that filing cabinet and they can get it out, the level of accuracy may be affected, and that's gonna have big behavioral implications. And whether that be an academic task or a social task, the fact that the information isn't necessarily accessed accurately, accurately 
will have an impact. The other last thing I'll say about verbal memory. So we know that learning is impaired. They kind of hang on to it, so it's, it's stored okay, but we, the accuracy of that retrieval, the accuracy getting the information out is a problem. The final thing is that they are impaired more, or what's been said, on explicit as opposed to implicit memory. So what that means is there's greater problems when I have to remember it freely and just sort of remember events than if you cue me a little bit. Okay, well that makes sense. Because remember I'm pulling out of a file folder and I'm kind of randomly pulling stuff out. So when I'm doing it on my own, which would be explicit, I'm kind of driving that process myself. I'm in my own filing cabinet. I'm flinging paper out like crazy. Any number of stories are coming out. But when you come in and help me with that filing cabinet and say, well, was it this or was it this? I do better. That's a cued recall. That's implicit memory, and kids with an FASD do better with that. They do a little bit better when there's a cue, when there's a reminder. So instead of what happened at the birthday party that week on the weekend, oh, I hear you went to the jungle gym to a birthday party on the weekend. Tell me about your jungle gym. There's a cue that orients them to the specific memory. So as opposed to saying big birthday party file, I've cued them to the jungle gym birthday party. Ooh, okay. Now that retrieval is connected a little bit better. So that's the implications of that. So that's verbal memory. Well, I can say a lot about memory. I'm going to have to go faster. Carmen's not going to get to anything. That's a problem when I start talking about memory. Anyway, visual memory. Um, when we're talking about visual memory, we're just that. Things that we see and how we remember what we see. Visual memory has also been identified as an area of some difficulty with for individuals with an FASD. Spatial memory in particular. So that's probably the biggie that people talk about the most when we're talking about um, visual memory impairment. So when I say spatial memory, what are we talking about? How do I get from here to here? So spatial memory means, it, it, I mean, I, I have spatial memory impairment. I get lost in a box. So, you know, these are the kids who are maybe, you know, particularly in like a junior high or high school, they never seem to quite get to their classrooms on time possibly because they're wandering the halls lost again because they forget that they had to go that way instead of that way because their spatial map of the school is not very good. So when they've been in school for five months and they say, oh yeah, I'm sorry I'm late, I, I took the wrong turn and you're going, yeah, right, you took the wrong, they actually maybe took the wrong turn. They maybe actually did have their spatial map of that school kind of confused because that is an area of some difficulty or they're just getting into trouble. But it is possible that spatial memory could be at the root of that. Um, and so as a result, there's this representation of any kind of spatial relationships where things are in space, where things are going on, that um, can be impaired with this population. So that can affect them, even if they're doing hand-eye coordination tasks. We, we do talk about motor skills sometimes as being a strength for, for this group, but at other times around aspects of coordination, when we think about spatial relationships, they may not be the strength we think they are. And so even, you know, if I'm doing especially things that really require, um, uh, you know, like if I'm working in a shop class or something like that, there's a lot of spatial relationships required for that. If I'm working big saws and where things are, that may sometimes be a challenge for some of these kids. And particularly remembering where they need to be and where things are, you think of the amount of memory because teaching is all about memory. You stand here, this is what safety looks like, you hold your hands here, don't get in the way of the saw. Oh, okay, I forgot and I put my body here. That's a spatial memory. Where do I even stand? Links to spatial memory. Oh, you mean I'm not supposed to put the board in front of me as it goes through the saw. You know, that's not a good idea. So really, repeating these kinds of things becomes very crucial because we expect that Showing people tasks is always the best way to learn. And, and it is, generally speaking, a good way to learn with this population. But there still needs to be a really um, large amount of repetition and not the assumption that simply showing them where things need to be and where you need to stand and how you need to do things is going to be sufficient in terms of, of teaching. Um, I've got in here better with objects and faces, meaning compared to spatial where things are in place, they can kind of remember concrete objects better, faces better. So these things are a little bit more concrete, a little bit less about relationships between different things. Now that all said, Carmen and I were talking on the way here, there's just an article that came out just, I don't know what, a month ago, not even, very recently, that said that, you know, children with an FASD are really impaired in their ability to 
differentiate faces and look at faces. So I say that this is better, and now there's this article that says there isn't. So I said earlier that there are certain areas where there are a lot of agreement, where we all agree with the FASD literature, like verbal learning. Pretty much everybody agrees. Verbal learning, big area of problem. Visual memory, much less agreement much less agreement, in part because visual memory is a lot more difficult to measure. It's a lot more difficult to know what's going on because it's not words. It's something that we're trying to kind of capture how you're mapping things out. Um, so right now, whether or not there's a strength in that area is a bit of a question. I'll leave it, I'll leave it to you as, as sort of the, the mysteries of the research world. But there definitely does seem to be strength when we're looking at more concrete objects. Something I can see, something that's very tangible, and I don't have to worry about where it is in space. So reminder cues that are very physical, solid, visual objects will probably be helpful. All right. So I've talked about the verbal and I've talked about visual memory, which sit in that sort of, like I said before, tape recorder or even the, you know, the model of memory, the information that I'm recording to get into my head, to hold it there, and then repeat it out. Those are the verbal and visual. But memory, as I started out with my quote, is way more than those things. Memory is big and it permeates many other systems. And we're not gonna go through all of them today or I would have you here for days, probably. But I wanna talk about three key things that we've looked at specific to the FASD population in terms of understanding memory as it fits into this bigger picture. One of those things is, is, is use of strategies. And as I talk about these things, I'm starting to talk about not just the tape recorder of memory, but how we use the tape recorder. So we're starting to talk about surrounding systems. And one of the surrounding systems of the words or thing, phrases that you may have heard before is executive function. Executive functions, um, executive systems, there's a lot of different words we use, are referring to sort of higher order systems that allow us to plan and execute activities. So they're sort of, you know, like those ultimate parent systems that are regulating everything that's going on in our brain, right? So it's, it's like that super awesome executive assistant who's working your filing cabinet system, okay? So we got the filing cabinet, we talked about our verbal and our visual filing cabinet, let's say. Um, now we're talking about our executive assistant, who's that amazing person who helps us to organize all that information and moves information around and works in a much bigger way. So I'm going to kind of use that analogy and, and think of that as sort of executive systems. And I'm not talking all about executive functioning today. But when we talk about memory, it's really impossible to talk about memory as it affects us in our whole lives without talking about executive functioning because they're very woven together. Memory is not, we're not just robots who hit the tape recorder. There are other systems that support it. So one of the systems that we wanted to look at or one of the aspects of executive function that we looked at at one point was the use of strategies. And what we said is perhaps part of the difficulty that kids are having with learning and we're interested in the learning, we're interested in the verbal memory. And when I say we, I'm talking about Carmen and myself. We, we did this um, uh, a few years ago. Um, we thought, well, perhaps part of it is because they just don't have the strategy. They don't know how to go about doing learning. So for example, if I gave them a list of words and said, remember these words, they're just trying to memorize word after word after word as opposed to using any kind of organized strategy, right? Like if I gave you a list of words and I said, okay, cow, house, moon, sun, you might sit there in your head and have a picture of a house with a cow standing in beside it and a moon or a sun up in the sky. And then you're gonna remember because you've kind of organized. You've got a system, right? You got a, we, we got strategies. So we thought, well, maybe their way of using strategies is affecting their ability to learn this information. So we took a look at this. And what we found is that, first of all, kids typically move when they're littles, they use a lot of visual strategies, right? Because they don't have a lot of language. So they're not gonna use language. They're gonna use the, the cow standing next to the house and, and things like that when they're, when they're little because language is, not, is still developing. As kids get older, they get more sophisticated in the strategies they use and they start to use a lot of language-based strategies. So they start to do chunking and organization that's much more semantically loaded. So the meaning of words takes on a lot more. And that gives them a lot more flexibility, particularly in a school system where learning is often language loaded. 
And so they begin to adapt and use a lot of language-based memory strategies. So what we found when we looked at kids with an FASD and compared them to typically developing kids is that the kids with an FASD shifted from visual strategies to verbal strategies much later than typically developing kids. So we saw this happening later. They made the shift, but much later. So those early elementary years when we're seeing kids making the shift more typically, the kids with an FASD were still using a lot of visual strategies. So what that means is that what we want to do is we want to be much more explicit with strategy training with kids early on. I'm going to talk about this. See, I keep jumping to my, my strategy section as I talk about memory. So I'm kind of, you know, doing two sections here. But anyway, bear with me. But what we found is that that shift takes place later. So early elementary, we may see most kids beginning to use verbal strategies as in they're in school, they're in a verbal learning environment. So they're starting to use those kinds of memory strategies. But kids with an FASD are not. They're still loading heavily on visual strategies. So they're not having the same success with that academic learning, even on those early years. So by the time they finally are doing it, they're behind on it. They're still very immature in their strategies because they're de developing late. And then the other thing we noticed is that even when they do begin to use strategies, they're using them less efficiently. So they're not as good at using the strategies because they've kind of figured them out and they're kind of cobbling them together. But they're not necessarily being trained or, or coached explicitly, intentionally, in how to use those strategies well. So as they figure them out and use them, they're not using them well. So one of the things that came out of this is not only was the learning affected, but the ability to strategize. That EA is not doing a really good job of helping them organize those filing cabinets. So maybe we can do some things around supporting that. So that was kind of how our line of thinking, and I'll let Carmen take that later on in a minute here. Another area of memory that we were really interested in, and again, I'm, when I, I say we, I'm always talking about Carmen, and I, even though you haven't, she's still sitting down right now, I keep pointing at her and things like that. Another thing that we were interested in, um, and so we said, okay, strategies. Now we know those are delayed. We're also interested in what's called source memory, our source monitoring aspects of memory. And what that means is when we learn something, so when my tape recorder is working, we're not just learning the content, we're also learning where we're learning it or who said that. So it's not just enough to say, I learned this. It's, you know, I learned this at school. Okay, well, who said that? Did your teacher say that or did your friend say that? Right? So when I come home and I say, I learned that there's a cow living on the moon. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Who told you that? Oh, my teacher. Well, I don't know if your teacher told you there's a cow living on the moon. Oh, there, uh, my teacher told me. Uh, for sure, for sure, for sure, my teacher said there's a cow living on the moon. Okay, well, you know what? Maybe it was their friend. But when your source memory is confused, you don't remember, you don't properly connect the source of the information with the information. And you see how quickly that can get very confusing. And that kind of lines up even when we were talking about the birthday party before and those mixed up filing cabinets. We see really mixed up filing cabinets when the source is confused. And so Carmen and I were really interested in this and we said, well, let's find out what's look, what it looks like in kids with an FASD. Do we see the same pattern of development as we do with typically developing kids? Meaning, do they have same kind of areas of difficulty as, as typical, typically developing kids? And are we seeing the same quality of source memory as we are? So the first thing we found is that kids with an FASD um, have the same areas of difficulty. So when we look at source memory, and, and, and I'm trying to be brief, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it. We're looking at things like, do, did I say it or did you say it? Did he say it or did she say it? Did I say it or did I think it? So there's three sort of different conditions, right? The one that's the hardest for all kids is whether or not I said it out loud or thought it in my head. Okay, it's difficult for all of us. How many of us have said that? Did I think that or did I say that out loud, right? How often have you had a moment like that, right? Okay, that kind of internal condition, that internal condition, did I say it or did I just think it, is the one that's hardest for everybody. And guess what? It's hardest for kids with an FASD. Right? They don't remember if they actually said something or they thought it. That gets really confused. They do better at saying which of the two people said it or if I said it or you said it. So those external kind of conditions, they do better with. 
That said, overall, they performed worse than, than the other kids. So what they showed us is that overall, they had a much more difficult time telling what the source of the information was for all sources. So compared to typically developing kids, if they were to say, yeah, she said it or he said it, they would get it right more often than the kids with an FASD. And so that's a big concern because that means when they're coming home and they're telling us that, you know, my teacher told me the cow was on the moon, they probably really believe that, at least a good percentage of the time. And it may not just reflect a language or a comprehension issue, but this is a memory issue. And very quickly you could see, stop lying. Stop lying like that, or you're making stories up. And we can see how that could lead to a lot of tension. If you really believe something is true, I mean, I think of times that you've had a memory error. We've all had them. When you're sure something happened a certain way and you're like, no, I'm sure it happened this way. And then finally somebody brings you a photograph and says, no, look, it didn't. You, they weren't at the party. Here's a picture of the party. They were not there. See? Oh, I swear they were. I totally remember it that way. But we're adamant, right? We don't like the idea that our internal storyline is wrong. Let's go back to my original quote. When we talked about memory being part of who we are and part of sort of the way we make sense of the world. If I don't have source correct, and if I can't even remember who said what, and that means my entire history, my narrative, could all be bungled up, how much does that confuse us? How much does that leave us feeling a little bit uncertain? What would that look like behaviorally when you're confronted on that? Particularly if we're confronted with your lying. But even think of times when you've had a memory error. Think of times when you've misremembered something and how almost unsettling it was, right? Where you kind of, when somebody prov provides that picture and you're going, oh, I guess they weren't there. What am I remembering? Where am I at? And you kind of have this moment of, oh, my entire meanness is kind of scattered because my memories are part of who I am. And if I can't trust my memories, then how do I know who I am? So those are deep philosophical issues, and I'm not suggesting that our kids are grappling with those at all times, but it still does have that profound impact when we're, we're struggling with this kind of memory. So that's source memory. So I've talked about strategies, how we learn things. I've talked about source, learning where we've learned things or what is the source of our information. And a third area of, of interest for Carmen and I is also how we put information together in memory. So now I'm thinking about how we're putting our filing cabinets together, how we're even organizing that. How when I'm in a room do I recognize what details are important in a situation and put those together and have a picture of what's happening. And what we found with kids with an FASD is that they really have serious deficits or serious problems in what we call memory consolidation the ability to put things together into a whole picture. So I, I'm going to show uh, uh, pictures of this. And, and, and you don't have them in your handout because I, can't, I couldn't share them. But I'm going to show them on the, the PowerPoint because my words don't suffice. I'm, I'm a visual kind of gal, so I, I always like visuals. Um, oh, this is a graph that just shows, and this is in your handouts, um, the differences that we saw, meaning that the control group on the test that I'm about to show you pictures of did significantly better than um, our FASD group. There were significant differences in the way that the kids with the FASD um, organized information. So what I've shown you now is a pictures from an eight-year-old. And in the top left corner, you see a picture of a figure, a rather complex looking figure. That's a figure that I ask kids to copy. So it sits there in front of them. They're looking at it. Yes, I know it's kind of complex. I have trouble copying it, I'll admit it. But anyway, um, that's why it's called a complex figure test. So they're required to copy that. The figure on your left bottom, so below that, is what was drawn by an eight-year-old who is typically developing. So that's a very typical eight-year-old representation of that picture. You see how they've tried to put all that complex stuff together. To the right of that is an individual with an FASD. So my right? Well, you're, so our, that's our left. Is the, the FASD is our left. Yeah, yeah. OK, the one that's not very good. <laughs> I think you can tell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. OK, everybody's going, we know. You're right. We're facing it. My right, <laughs> your left. Yes. OK, it's all about me. Oh, is this a source memory? No, this is spatial, guys. This is yeah. spatial memory. <laughs> I don't remember where I am. Um, <laughs> thank you. Okay. 
The picture that looks closer to the actual drawing is the one that was produced by typically developing kids. The picture that's kind of underneath the eight-year-old words there is the one that was done by an individual with an FASD. What you see there is, first of all, they're very, very different. And, and what should be right apparent to you is, wow, that picture is not done very well. And that picture does not look at all like the, the image in the top corner. Um, and remember, this is copied. So we're not even doing memory yet. We're just looking at the copy because I'm looking at how information is pieced together. So we're only looking at how they're piecing it together when they're first seeing it. Because if you can't even piece it together in the first place, how are you going to remember it? So we're looking even at those precursors, those early start places. And what's happened with these, this eight-year-old is there's no integrated sense of the whole figure. Most kids will start with a big kind of rectangle or they'll recognize that there's a rectangle in that figure. There's no rectangle in our figure with that individual. They put in a lot of the little details. You see how many details are there? They're lovely. Look at all those details. They're all jammed together, but there's no composite sense of that figure. So imagine seeing the world in this way. Imagine your ability to put the world together like this. First of all, if this is how you see the world and reproduce the world, how are you going to remember it? If this is what you're seeing, what are you going to be remembering? Certainly not the figure in the top. So right away, because you can't put those pieces together and organize them efficiently, we know that you're not even, we're not even to memory. We're at that precursor of memory. We're at that organizational component. We're with that you know, executive assistance system. And there's no sense of that. And this is visual too, so there's no language load here. This is what I'm seeing and how I'm putting information together. If I walk into a room and I see a whole bunch of details and I can't put them together, how am I going to get meaning from a situation and then have an accurate recall of what that situation is? I often use this example, so if you've heard it from me before, I'm sorry, but it's my favorite. You walk into a room and everybody in there is wearing black. And you see a bunch of people over there wearing black and they're laughing and they're joking. You see people over there and they're crying and there's some flowers up at the front of the room and there's people over there sitting really quietly, maybe praying or engaged in something else, whatever. You walk in the room, an individual with an FASD is going to walk in and they're going to see these clusters of people, or some of them may. Of course, these are never, everybody is not the same. And they see these different things and they go, oh, there's people laughing. Clearly, I'm at a party. So I'm going to behave accordingly because the way I have taken those details and put them together is not consolidated. I couldn't put the pieces of the puzzle together. I only see the pieces for their individual. So I will behave accordingly. I'm at a party, so what do I do? The rest of us walk into the room and we see the people laughing, but we also see these other things and we say, I'm at a funeral. I need to behave accordingly. Here's my funeral behavior. And so we sometimes make assumptions, and that's a very extreme example, but we often make assumptions that when a person walks into a situation, they can identify cues in a room, cues in a situation that direct our behavior. We do it all the time. We do it so often we don't even know we're doing it. And we draw on our memory and we draw on our ability to consolidate and put information together to take those cues and tell us how to behave and what to do in a given situation. If I can't even put those cues together, I'm not even going to be able to draw on that memory in an accurate way, which is going to affect my behavior. So I have one other picture that shows you even as it develops. And this is very typical, by the way. This drawing, I didn't just pick the worst or, or the most, you know. This is a very typical kind of pattern that we see with this particular test. Um, next you see I've got a 10-year-old. And again, the one that's much more faded is the typically developing. This 10-year-old, he's done much better, but you notice that they're still missing that core rectangle. That core structure to set it up is still absent. The details are all in there, but they're kind of shoved in there in kind of you know, difficult and, and abstract kind of ways. So yes, it's getting a little bit closer, but it's still very far away from accurate. Given that this is a copy, that picture is right in front. They're staring at it while they're doing this. Needless to say, the actual memory scores on this become even worse because they're remembering it for details. And they're not remembering it for that consolidation, that whole. So if I can't piece it all together, I don't even have it when I'm looking at it. 
I'm going to have much less of it later on. And so what we see over time is that the entire structure falls apart and we only have a lot of the pieces on the page or we're losing a lot of details because that's a lot of details to remember. Um, if I remember it like the, the, the child on the, in the lighter drawing, <laughs> I don't even want to say right or left anymore because now I'm, I'm, I'm primed to be sensitive here, but uh, it looked at that and said, oh, it's kind of like a rocket ship and started drawing this rocket ship with all these pieces. Well, that's a great, you know, elaboration strategy, gave it meaning, gave it structure. Whereas this, the other child, the child with an FASD, had to remember all those details without any overarching strategy or structure to it. So, I think I've said enough. I'm sure if, if you have questions on this stuff, you will email me. So those are some of the key areas of memory problems and, and deficits in an individual with FASD and strengths. I think we've talked about both of them a little bit and, and areas that we can work on and things that we can draw from. And even as I talk about the difficulties with integration, um, we can also think about the fact that cued memory is stronger. So the more we can cue those situations, so if I'm walking in, what do I say? We're going to a funeral. That means you do this explicit cued teaching is becomes important. We're going into gym class now. That means this. We're going into math now. That means this. We're reminding. We're transitioning because we know that the ability to put information together from those cues is not going to be what we expect. So and we'll come back to these strategies and, and talk about them a little bit more. So I'm going to turn it over now to, to Carmen, who's going to talk about memory intervention research. And while she's talking about this, so I asked you to think a little bit about behavior when I was talking about the memory systems and memory functioning. So now that Carmen, well, Carmen's talking about intervention, again, what she's talking about is, well, problems have been identified and outcomes are, are you know, um, what outcomes are going to be sought, are, are, what goals are going to be pursued have been set in this literature. And then what they've done is they've done a program and they've said, did we meet those goals? Did we achieve those outcomes? And then they transfer the information, which is essentially what Carmen's doing. So when you're listening to this, think about what that means for you when you're in practice in terms of what you're doing and how you can apply that. And now I'm really going to stop because otherwise Carmen will you know, start flinging things at me and say, get off of there. No, I think we could listen to you forever. Uh. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to switch gears a bit here and um, pick, up, pick up where, where Jackie left off and discuss some of the memory intervention research that's out there. I'm going to discuss um, research with other clinical populations as well as research with FASD because there isn't a lot of research on effective um, intervention, sp sorry, specific memory interventions with individuals with FASD. So I will be talking about the other research in other populations as well. So there is actually a long history of, of research on interventions to improve memory in children with developmental disabilities. Um, so there, there's quite a bit of research out there and Jackie and I did a, a review of this research um, a couple of years back for a, a chapter that was um, published. Um, we know that memory difficulties, it's not just not being able to remember the information, it also impacts a lot of other areas in your life. So it affects your language, as Jackie talked about, it affects your reading, and it also affects your social skills, your ability to interact with other people. If you don't remember something that they told you last time or um, specific personal information about them, I mean, you can just imagine how this can just really affect your, your overall functioning. And because of this profound impact on, on these other areas, it's also going to affect things like your self-esteem. You're going to have lower self-esteem if you're not putting together the information properly, you can't remember it. Um, and then obviously it's definitely going to affect your performance in school. Um, the bulk of what we do in school is dependent on our memory and one area that's very dependent on memory is doing math. So re remembering numbers, remembering formulas, um, how to do basic um, arithmetic. So it really imp imp um, impairs math ability. And we know actually within FASD research, um, we've actually shown in some of our research that um, a lot of the math difficulties in kids with FASD are related to underlying difficulties in memory. And I'm going to be talking about that study in the next presentation that is focused on, on mathematics and FASD. So I'm not going to focus on it here. Um, but we definitely know that um, in, in all types of, in, in children with a, a variety of disabilities that poor memory affects many different facets of their of their functioning. But 
good thing to know is that there are positive effects of memory interventions out there and they have been documented with children with Down syndrome, children with learning disabilities, attention deficit, deficit hyperactivity disorder, children with brain injury as well as FASD. Now these are just some of, uh, of the um, clinical populations, definitely not all, there are other ones out there, but these are kind of the main ones that um, have had successful intervention research on. I'm gonna talk about the Down syndrome, ADHD, brain in injury and FASD today, just um, we won't be able to talk about it all. And I'll just talk about pieces of intervention research in those areas. So, I'm going to start with the Down syndrome research. Um, a lot of the intervention research that's out there is focused on short-term memory, which is really our, it's our working memory, it's what we're actively working on right now. It's our immediate short-term rem memory. So if a person asks you to remember a phone number and you have to recall that phone number back to them, that's your immediate working memory. So it hasn't gone quite into long-term memory yet where we have to retrieve it from long-term memory. It's as we're processing the information and recalling it immediately after. Okay. So a lot of the research in clinical populations looking at intervention research is on the short-term memory because it's probably one of the easiest areas to study and an easy and, and um, one of the easiest areas to, to document whether or not interventions are effective. It's a lot more difficult to see whether or not interventions are effective at improving your long-term memory because those things are just a lot harder to measure. Okay, so that's short-term memory. Um, so we know that children with Down syndrome actually have a lot of difficulties with short-term memory. They have v very poor short-term memory. Um, most of the time, short-term or working memory, I'll kind of use those, I'll probably I'll, I'll use those words interchangeably, um, is measured with tasks where we ask an individual to recall a random um, list of words or numbers. So an experimenter will say various numbers to a child, um, starting with two numbers, and then the child has to repeat them, and then they'll go to three numbers, the child has to repeat them back in the same order, four numbers and so on. And so you keep going until you get to the longest list of items that the person is able to recall to you in the correct order. Okay, does that make sense? And so the longest list of items that a person is able to recall is referred to as your memory span. So that's kind of like the capacity for your short-term memory span. So most people um, are able to successfully recall anywhere from like seven to nine to 10 items, numbers or words in a list. And most phone numbers are seven digits long and that's kind of, that has to do with partly because of our, our memory and how we're able to retrieve information and recall it. So most of the time we can usually recall a phone number once it's um, given to us, but we usually have to repeat it a few times in our heads. And within five minutes, you know very well if you hang up the phone and if you don't dial that number right away, you're gonna forget it in five minutes. So I'm gonna talk about um, this um, more as we go through the presentation. So like I said, children with Down syndrome have a lot of difficulties with a short-term memory. And so like I said, most people, seven to nine items they can recall. Well, by the time they're adolescents, individuals with the Down syndrome usually can only recall three or four items. So that's a very, very poor short-term memory, okay? Three or four items beyond that, they can't remember them. So um, there's actually quite a bit of research looking at how to improve this type of memory impairment in children with Down syndrome. So in 1993, broadly, they tested a memory intervention for children with Down syndrome. They had ranging from age four to 18. And they had a six week memory intervention and where they trained the children in rehearsal. So that's the ability to um, basically in rehearsal, you rehearse the information over and over in order to retrieve it for later recall. So like I said, when you're trying to remember a phone number, um, you usually have to keep saying it over and over inside your head, three, four, seven, five, one, two, four, three, four, seven, and, and until you get to the phone to plug it in. If you don't keep doing it, you're probably gonna forget it. I'm sure we've all been there and done that. So they, they looked at training and rehearsal, um, teaching people how to rehearse the information, and then also in organization, so teaching them how to categorize and group information, because if you put it in categories or group it, you're better able to recall it. Um, rather than just um, recalling the whole list of items, if you're if you're trying to recall a grocery list, it's better. It's probably easier to recall um, the fruit information or the the produce together, and then your your meat and things like that. So just teaching them how to group and categorize the information, and then they had a control group where they had no training. Um, 
and this intervention lasted six weeks so it was a, a pretty intensive intervention that they did with the the children and um, it was done with an experimenter and so they found that before the interventions they tested the children's memory they had very similar memory before the intervention and it was similarly poor so um, the children did quite poor on the memory tests. But after the intervention, they saw dramatic inc um, increases in the experimental group in their, in their memory performance on various tasks, but not in the control group. So again, he here we see really um, evidence for the effectiveness of this intervention. Now, when they looked at the children who received more of the rehearsal training, well, of course, that was more effective on tasks that required rehearsal of information. So things like remembering random lists of, of numbers and things like that. And the children that had their organizational training was more effective when they're looking at organizational tax, tasks where they were remembering information that could be clustered or categorized and whatnot. They conducted a follow-up study with these same children um, two and eight months later, and the experimental group still had maintained their memory improvements. But in this two and eight months later, they didn't do any further intervention with these children. They just had that six-week intervention. So yeah, we see the, the improvements six weeks, but even when they're not getting any more intervention, we're still seeing those improvements maintained two and eight months later. So that's a really important thing because um, just this, you know, a six-week intervention, yeah, it's pretty intensive, but those are making some hopefully lifelong learning and improvements in these children. Now, interesting here, they had some of the children were trained um, in the tasks by a key worker. So the key worker here was either a teacher or a parent, and, and they did the intervention with them. And some were trained by an experimenter. And they actually found that the kids that were trained by the teacher or parent did better than those that were trained by an experimenter. So we talked a little bit about this last time, the importance of, of having home-based interventions, things that parents can do, things that teachers can do. And probably um, the authors in the study um, reasoned that probably the reason that um, the key workers, the parent, the teacher, um, had more success with the child is they have more opportunities to interact with the child in everyday life. So the experimenter would, would see the child once a week for their memory training, but a parent sees their child every day. So they have more opportunities to prompt the child on the intervention to remind them of the strategies and the skills throughout the day. So again, this re really shows the benefits of training parents and teachers to do these types of interventions with children. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. Um, another study with children with Down syndrome found that um, this one just focused specifically on the rehearsal training and they had a very intensive eight week intervention. So these are, you know, um, pretty big studies here and it did improve memory span in children and adults with Down syndrome and again they looked at the children and adults six weeks and six months after the intervention and the experimental group still showed improvements so, so their performance was still higher than it was before the intervention but it was actually slightly lower than it was immediately after the intervention so you, you have pre-intervention and then you have after the intervention this this large gain in memory span when you look at them six weeks and six months better they're still higher than they were to begin with but not quite as high as they were immediately after the intervention so yes um, these interventions can work and um, the gains can be maintained over time but it looks like we probably have to do some sort of maintenance work to to keep um, these improvements active and to keep the individuals working on the skills because they they do um, they may tend to decrease over time okay. so there's there like I said there's a lot of research on down syndrome particularly I'm just um, talking about three studies there now I'm going to talk a bit about the ADHD research um, of course, when we think of ADHD, we think of problems with attention, um, which is obviously a, a very big issue for these individuals. But they also, there's a lot of evidence that these individuals have a lot of difficulty with working memory and being able to remember um, um, and information and retrieve it. And actually that a lot, you know, working memory is directly tied to our attention as well. So if we can't remember information, we can't pay attention to it. If we can't pay attention to it, we can't re re remember it. So it's... Um, they go hand in hand, working memory and attention. So there are other um, programs out there that are d designed looking at working memory and attention together. 
So Klingberg et al. have examined the effect of a cog cognitive um, computerized working memory and attention training program. Now this is called COGMED and you can go look up this program online. It's just www.cogmed.com and it's um, a very intensive, highly researched computerized intervention um, to improve um, working memory and attention in children. Um, they, they do a, a variety of exercises that are um, designed to target working memory and attention and the exercises are adjusted um, to the difficulty level needed for each person. So it's an intensive intervention as, as you can see here. It's usually five week intervention. You want to have more than 20 training sessions so that's looking at four to five sessions a week. So it's quite in um, intensive and they adjust the difficulty to each person so that each time it's getting more difficult but it's at your level a and you can actually do this cognitive intervention with children as young as preschool ages all the way up to adults. So it's quite a wide age range that it can be done with. Um, it's computerized so it can be done at home um, or at school but it, it, it is done um, with the assistance of a trained coach. Um, that is trained in the program that helps individual go through it and, and coach along the way. Um, so I'm not going to be able to go through all the tasks that they do obviously but um, if anybody's interested they can definitely go in and look at the program online. It is a program that you have to purchase so it, it's not free. Um, but it is um, used in a lot of populations um, looking at the effectiveness. So what Klingberg um, et al. did is they um, they basically looked at how effective this program was for, for increasing memory as well as other skills in children with ADHD. So they had children that were aged 7 to 12 and they did five weeks of this intensive intervention. They did typically four sessions a week. They actually, they had to, in order to stay in the study, they had to have completed more than 20 training sessions over the five weeks. Okay, And so I think most of the sessions were about 45 minutes long. It's not like they're um, super long but um, long enough that they can see some improvements and they did fi find that um, in this study the treatment group showed in significant gains on measures of their visual spatial working memory so Jackie talked about what the visual spatial working memory and memory is right after the intervention and so right after the five weeks and then again those um, benefits were maintained three months later where they weren't still getting this cognitive intervention Okay. So it definitely improved memory and these memory um, gains were maintained. But it also improved verbal working memory. So verbal is, is re remembering verbal lists of information, things that I was talking about earlier. It also had um, positive improvements on their inhib inhibition, on their reasoning and on their attention. So not just improving memory, it kind of um, worked on other areas as well because it was focused on attention as well. So this is one great example of, of an intervention. Um, you know, it's very intensive and it does cost money, but it's very effective in improving memory and other skills related to memory. Um, individuals that have acquired brain injury, there's also a lot of um, research looking at memory interventions for these individuals. Um, acquired brain injury, um, a, one of the um, uh, results of that can be memory impairments. So individuals with acquired brain injury, there is research looking at these type of, types of interventions um, in acquired brain injury. One program, another program, is the Amsterdam Memory and Attention Training um, System for Children. And again, this is a, a program that is not just focusing on memory, it's focusing on memory and attention because these two systems are ho so highly related that um, we need to kind of look at them together. So this is a very intensive intervention. Um, this is 18 to 20 weeks long, 45 minutes a day. Um, and I think it was typically like five days a week. So it's a, it's a very intensive intervention. Um, and again, it's going through various practice and games and memory and attention techniques that were done with a trained coach in this program. But um, there's quite a bit of research on it to show that it is very, um, it was very effective in improving memory and attention in children with acquired brain injury. And follow-up research shows that again these um, benefits were maintained at a six-month follow-up. So most of the interventions that, that we're talking about um, have been very effective and the benefits are maintained. Now there aren't a lot of follow-ups done beyond six months that we've seen in the research. So again um, we need to see how long these gains are maintained and how much maintenance does need to be done later on because 
that one study did show that, that the, the gains were starting to de decrease over time. So there probably is some maintenance that you're going to have to do after a, a six-month period. But um, we definitely do see the, the benefits. Okay, so that brings us to the research on memory interventions for children with FASD. And um, Jackie and I um, did do a study on this, and this is really actually the only study published on looking specifically on how to improve memory in children with FASD. So what we did is we looked specifically at that rehearsal um, strategy, whether or not if we taught children with FASD how to rehearse information, would it improve their memory? Now, one thing I think I didn't mention when I talked about the rehearsal um, background is that um, rehearsal is a strategy that children start to spontaneously use around the age of seven. So that's when children start to, to realize that they can actually rehearse information inside their head in order to retrieve it for later on. Under the age of seven, um, as Jackie talked about, children tend to use more visual-based strategies, so they may remember what the items look like rather than repeating the items in their head. Okay, so usually around age seven, children start to use this strategy and then it, um, it is very effective in improving their memory. And it's something that, that we, we kind of do every day and we kind of probably just take it for granted, don't always realize that we're rehearsing information, but we do it quite a bit. <clears throat> so in this study, um, we had 33 children with FASD and they were aged 4 to 11 years of age. So we actually started with um, children that were quite young, or we had ch some children that were quite young, who were younger than the age um, where you would expect them to be spontaneously using rehearsal because we wanted to have an age span of children that maybe wouldn't be using rehearsal yet, as well as children old over the age of seven who typically developing children probably would be using rehearsal, but we didn't know what children with FASD would be doing. We didn't know whether or not they would already be spontaneously using rehearsal or not. Okay. Um, so we assigned them to two groups. We had an experimental group who received rehearsal training and a control group who received no training. So the control group here isn't a control group of children without FASD. It's a control group of children with FASD who did not receive the intervention. So we have FASD divided into the training and the no training. And all we did in the experimental group, we didn't do an intensive six week, eight week intervention. We did one session with the children where we just gave them instructions on how to remember information. So, so we just told them basically that um, some people have special ways of remembering things. And one way to remember things is to repeat the information over and over in your head, or you can whisper it to yourself um, in order to remember it. And you would think that most people, like I said, would know this and it's kind of intuitive, but it, it's not. And children under age seven don't do this. And as we found children with FASD, most of them were not doing it at the beginning of the study. Most of the children kind of looked at us like, wow, really, I can just repeat the information over and over and I'm gonna remember it. And you know, even some of the 10 year olds had no idea that they could be doing this strategy. And it's something that is so simple and so basic, but it can have such a profound impact on how we process and remember information. And most of these kids were not doing it. So again, this shows um, a lot of their memory impairments probably had to do with just the lack of strategies and not using these strategies that we just assume people use. Okay, so what we did is we had um, day one, we had a pretest, and we tested their memory before the intervention. So they did a digit span test. And what that test is, it's um, like I said, usually you have individuals who call random lists of numbers or letters, and that is to measure their short term memory. So the digit span is just having them recall random lists of numbers that go increasing in length as they go through the task. So it starts with two numbers, then goes to three numbers, goes to four numbers, five numbers, and you stop when they can no longer um, remember the list of numbers. Okay. So on day one, we tested um, both the experimental and control group. We, we tested their, their memory for numbers, their digit span. And then immediately after that, or shortly after on the same day, we did the rehearsal training with the experimental group, which was, you know, really only 10, 15 minutes instructing them on how to rehearse information and teaching them this strategy. And during that time, the control group just had a short break where they just talked with the experimenter. And then we tested their memory again on these digit span tasks. Now, of course, we use different um, lists of numbers, so it, it wouldn't be related to the numbers that they had um, remembered in the first task, which was only 15 minutes before that. So we did the rehearsal training, we gave them the memory test again, and 
allowed um, a chance for them to rehearse the information if, if they were going to. Um, so we looked at the performance on the task and then we brought them back a week later, about a week later. Um, we didn't get everybody back in exactly on the week, but I think it ranged from like six to ten days later or something like that. Um, and with the experimental group, we didn't do an, an intensive training again. I mean, it wasn't even that intensive to begin with. We just reminded them. Now, remember last time we worked on this, we, we taught you um, different techniques to, or, um, to remember information, how you can repeat it in their head. So we just reminded them of the strategy. And then again, we did a third memory test with them. And the control group, again, they just had nothing. We just gave them the memory test again. So even though across the three time periods, they were doing the same type of test, which is a digit span memory test. They, it, it used different numbers and different lists of numbers, so there could be no learning from the previous lists. We also um, carefully observed what the children were doing when they were doing these tasks. Now, most of us, um, a lot of the times, will we rehearse information quietly inside of our heads without even saying it out loud, but a lot of young children and a lot of adults still do this too where you actually whisper the information like one two three six, you know over and over in your head you move your lips you, um you do things that show that you're rehearsing the information kind of like i just did when i was you know doing that so we also recorded this evidence this this was the behavioral evidence of whether or not they were actually using the strategy that we taught them or did not teach them in the control group okay so what did we find well we found that um in the experimental group, as you can see at the pretest, the memory on the, the task was pretty similar between the control and experimental group. The control group is in pink. Actually, the experimental group was slightly lower on the pretest, although the difference wasn't significant there. By the post test one, the first post test, we do see the experimental group increasing in their memory, but the control, control group wasn't. Their memory stayed the same. And then by the post test two, which was a, an, a week later, where they just got this brief reminder, again, we see the experimental group increasing actually even more at this time. And the control group's performance was staying the same. So we saw significant increases over um, after the intervention in the experimental group, but no increases in the control group. Now, another thing that was really important here is age was not correlated with whether the children showed an increase in their memory span in the experimental group. So what this means is that basically the um, intervention was an effective for the younger children and the older children. It wasn't only the older children that benefited from learning this rehearsal strategy, all children did. So it didn't matter if you were four or if you were 11, you generally saw increases in your memory. So this is actually important because it actually shows that even younger than the age where typically developing children start using this strategy, we can show improvements in kids with FASD. Now, when we look at the behavioral evidence, it was even, um, it was quite compelling as well. Here we see, this is whether or not they were showing behavioral evidence of using rehearsal. So whether or not they were moving their lips, um, whispering the items uh, out loud, or just kind of melting the items, we recorded this. And as you can see at pretest, um, almost no children were, were showing behavioral evidence of using rehearsal in both the control and the experimental group. So that's important. Again, that shows that, look at look, there, less than 10% of the children were using rehearsal or, or were um, explicitly showing that they were using rehearsal at the pretest. Okay, and again, that probably has to do with why they have such poor memory difficulties if they're not using this rehearsal strategy. When you look at the post-test one, the experimental group, which is the, I guess that would be more like the purplish color, um, showed a lot of evidence of using rehearsal. So more, ha more than half of the sample um, were showing behavioral evidence of using rehearsal, whereas the control group, not that many were using rehearsal or showing behavioral evidence that they were. Remember the control group received no instruction on how to do this. And then by post-test two, again, still a very high percentage of children in the experimental group were, using, were showing behavioral evidence of using rehearsal and significantly more than in the control group. An interesting thing here is that the control group, we actually see them, actually more children showing this behavioral evidence of using rehearsal by the time that it came to the third memory test. And so we thought perhaps some of the children, we gave them this task three times, perhaps some of them, in, even in the control group, just started spontaneously using rehearsal on their own, even though we didn't teach it to them. Because again, it doesn't mean that absolutely no children are doing this, and then they can't be doing it if we didn't teach it to them. But it was much more prominent in the experimental group. 
So we did show that rehearsal training was effective in improving um, memory among children with FASD and specifically on a memory for numbers task, a digit span task. Age wasn't correlated with increases in memory span. So rehearsal training can be beneficial for children of all ages, even preschool children. So this is something that, that we can be doing all the time with these kids. It, it can be done in school, it can be done at home. Just constantly reminding children on how to remember things is um, beneficial. And like I said, our intervention was 10, 15 minutes. It was nothing intensive and we still, still saw improvements, which really makes us think, well, if we saw improvements with such a short basic intervention, what could we do if we were doing these eight weeks, six weeks intensive interventions with these children? Which is really where I'm hoping that we'll move in the research. And again, like I said last time, when we come back and do a presentation like this in five years, I'm really hoping that there's a lot more of this, more of this intensive intervention research in FASD, um, looking at these other programs like CogMed and, and these other programs that are out there. Um, we found that more children in the experimental group showed the behavioral evidence of using rehearsal after the intervention. So not just are they using it, they're showing that they're using it. Um, Age was not related to whether or not they showed the behavioral evidence. So again, younger children were showing behavioral evidence as well as the older children. It wasn't just the older children that were showing that, um, that behaviorally that they were using this strategy. One thing I forgot to mention actually is not only did we record what they were doing when they're doing the task, after they were done the task, we asked them what they did to remember the item. So we specifically asked them, now tell us what you did. So when the, only, the only time in the study where we actually found an age difference was when we asked them what they were doing to remember the items, the older children were better able to articulate that they were re um, using rehearsal. So even um, the younger children, even if they, were, they showed behavioral evidence of using rehearsal, they weren't as able to actually say, this is exactly what I was doing. But the older children, because they have better language skills and whatnot, um, were able to actually articulate, I was specifically using this strategy and this is how I was doing it. Mm -hmm. So that's what we find in the FASD research. And really, like I said, this is um, the only memory intervention study that, that I'm aware of. Um, on specifically focused on memory in kids with FASD. There are other interventions that um, may be broader cognitive interventions that obviously maybe there may be some, some components of memory involved in the intervention because memory is involved in so many things that we do, but this is really one that's specifically focused on memory. But as you can see, there, there was quite a bit of research that I reviewed on other populations. Some of it w was rehearsal type information or rehearsal type interventions, but other ones were more um, cognitive interventions focusing on working memory and attention. And so there's a lot that we can learn from this other research and hopefully apply to the FASD research and look at whether or not these other types of interventions are effective in children with FASD as well. So I think that brings me to the end of that segment. And now Jackie is going to come back to some of these implications and um, applic applications and how to really um, use strategies to improve memory. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Great. Um, so yeah, um, I'll pick up again. And um, I'm going to start with uh, functional implications. And, and we've kind of already talked about this because I sort of did this while I was talking about memory. So I jumped the gun a little bit. But um, just to kind of review a, a little bit or, and, and make sure that I cover all the ground, when I'm saying functional implications, what I'm talking about is, is the, the big picture of what you're going to see. So what does this mean when a child is having a memory problem? What does it mean? What am I going to see? What is it going to look like? What, what might be going on day to day? And, and I'm not intending this to be exhaustive, but I put down a bunch of things that are the kind of um, issues that we tend to see. One of them is the sounds good. And we talked about this with language as well. Once again, you know, when we get to language and memory with all these systems, they're really intertwined. When are we dealing with memory? When are we dealing with language? Well, you know, they're both involved, particularly when we're dealing with um, conversation or talking. So sounds good, particularly when he or she controls the interaction. Again, that's really important because if you're controlling it, if you're driving it, um, it's easier to do it than when somebody's asking questions. So if somebody's saying, oh, tell me about this or tell me about that, okay, that's drawing more directly on memory and I have to think about what I'm trying to retrieve. When I drive it, when I control it, 
I get to pick and choose what I want to remember, whatever's accessible to me. So they may sound better. They might sound, you know, like they remember things better, even if they're reviewing academic things. If they get to choose what they're going to review, they may sound like they have a better grasp of a topic than they really do because they're going to give you what they do remember. Um, Consequently, there could be a tendency to dominate interactions. There could be poor reciprocal communication. Carmen talked about, you know, when she talked about the social aspect, when she was talking about social skills, how you don't remember what somebody already told you in terms of personal information. Um, you may even just be in um, a, a conversation where you don't remember what was said, you know, two minutes ago. And so you're repeating it. You're not responding appropriately to that social interaction. So those um, social skills can be really compromised because of memory. Not because I don't care about what you're saying, not because I'm not interested in you, because I really am just not remembering. And when I'm not remembering, I'm compensating as best I can. And sometimes the way I compensate for not remembering is to try to dominate or try to run things a little bit because it masks the fact that I just don't remember. Um, they can be easily lost. Um, we talked about that, even in a school. <laughs> You think that they know their way around, they're getting lost easily, they're not finding, finding their way around. So that's that spatial memory we talked about. Weak academics. If you can't get the information and if there's a problem with learning, it's going to affect your academics across the board. It's going to change the way you learn. Um, you may be overwhelmed with a workload fairly easily if you're really struggling to remember things. You know, think about a time, again, that you've had a hard time remembering something. And we sit there and we devote a lot of energy. To, oh, what was that I was thinking? Mm, it's on the tip of my tongue. There's a lot of effort and energy that goes into that. So if all of your memory requires that kind of energy, how quickly are you going to be overwhelmed with a typical workload that puts a lot of demand on memory? Because you're having to work harder to access that information in your memory than anyone else. So everyone else is kind of remembering like this and then performing the task. You are remembering, ah, okay, got it. Oh, okay, got it. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe those aren't the best expressions, but anyway, but you get my drift. Then you're going to be more quickly overwhelmed. You're going to get really fatigued. No kidding. It's going to take you longer to get things out because it takes so much more work and effort to get to that memory. You may find it hard to keep up in class. Again, you're slower because it takes longer to access the memory, to put that in place. Even learning takes so much longer, you're going to find it hard to keep up because you need to hear things more often in order to learn them and remember them. So you're not going to be moving at the same rate as your peers necessarily. You'll be best with concrete visual tasks. Again, when it's a little bit more tangible and it's set. May require support organizing information. We talked about that consolidation. So I don't necessarily know how all the pieces go together, but if you help me a little bit, if you cue me a little bit, then I'll do better. Maybe misunderstood and feel frustrated. So that you may see a lot of frustration behavior because they're not able to perform, they're not feeling understood, they're struggling to do their best. Maybe they're working twice as hard as some of the other kids, but performing more poorly because they're struggling with memory. You're going to see a high degree of frustration and then frustration behavior, which can include things like avoidance strategies. And we all know what avoidance looks like. Avoidance can look like things getting thrown across a classroom. Avoidance can look like not coming to school. Avoidance can look like hiding in my bedroom and not wanting to talk to you. You know, avoidance can look like a lot of different things may have difficulty distinguishing reliable from unreliable sources of information. You recall we talked about source memory. So if I don't even remember where things came from, how do I begin to think about whether or not that's reliable or unreliable? That cow on the moon, if I don't even know where the source is, how do I know how reliable it is? I fully believe it. Of course the cow's on the moon. Now that may be you know, a fairly benign thing to remember, but what about I should go to this place at midnight and meet this person and then carry this package over to this other house? <laughs> okay, do I remember that these are, you know, not, this is not my reliable source when they're telling me this is the good thing to do and this is the good way to make friends? Um, may struggle discriminating actions from intentions. I may not always know what was an action versus an intention, particularly if I don't remember where things came from and, and what I said and what I did, what was intended. Uh, may not consistently differentiate fact from fantasy. Again, did that happen in my head or outside? Where's the line? That can get blurred. That can be a little bit confused. Because if I don't know where the source of the information is, 
what does that mean for how I'm remembering it and how I'm making sense of the world? I don't know if that came from inside my head or on that television screen or from the playground or in the classroom. I just know it got into my head somewhere. So what does that mean about that information and how I'm making sense of my world? And note that I say consistently, meaning it's not always wrong and this isn't a blanket statement for everybody with an FASD across the board all the time, right? We know that there's tremendous variability in this population between individuals, but also within an individual from day to day and, and within their skill set. So we're talking about consistent application. So it's not as though everything will be mixed up and blurred, but enough is that it's going to create some of the substantial problems that we see day to day, behaviorally and functionally. So we can approach this in terms of our strategies and interventions, looking at both accommodation and intervention. So the way I differentiate these two or think about these is I think of accommodation in terms of what we do to structure an environment or support an individual, and intervention in terms of what we can do directly to help them make changes sort of more within themselves. So I want to talk a little bit about both, and, and I have already a little bit, but um, let, we'll go over some of these. So accommodations, things we can do, for example, in a home or classroom environment, uh, work environment possibly, any of these kind of environments, uh, might be things like decreasing content to learn. Reduce it. More time, that allows for more time to learn, that allows for more time to process the information, to get it in without getting overwhelmed. These aren't, by the way, rocket science, and these are things that I'm sure most of you are doing already and understand already, but it's worth repeating and to think about it's also worth saying here too that while we talk about these, I would love to hear other accommodations that people are using and finding effective or ways in which they're not finding things useful. Because we need to kind of, this is where feedback from folks who are doing this every day becomes really important for us as we begin to understand what's working and what's not. Um, more time for learning, which is part was linked to that decreased content. Use of visual concrete cues, so keeping it quite concrete. Remember that figure, that drawing, the more abstract and the more complex something gets, the more it gets obstructed. So we want to keep things fairly concrete and even familiar. As much as um, visual cues can be familiar, um, a concrete object that a child knows um, that is familiar to them. Um, if, if we're trying to remind them about time is running up, do we, you know, can I put a picture of a stopwatch or something that is familiar to them that they will recognize that has meaning? That would be like a concrete visual cue. Um, reconsider how we challenge lies. This one's a tough one, right? Because kids lie and kids can be deceptive and, and I'm certainly not pretending otherwise. But what about when it's memory? And what about when they're not intentionally lying and they're not making up stories and they're not trying to you know, sell you down the river, but rather they're really actually confused and we're dealing with a memory issue. So we really need to ponder that and think about is this an intentional deceit or is this something else? And, and perhaps rather than saying, tell me the truth, we need to move beyond tell me the truth to where do we go from here and think about the solution. Because it could be that that's truth is there remembering it, even if it's wrong. So what do we say instead? How do we go forward with that instead? Well, you know, your teacher told you the cow was on the moon, but how would we know if a cow really was on the moon? How would a cow survive on the moon? And so we work forward and we discuss it. Okay, well, talk to your teacher more and let's write a little note that you're going to talk to your teacher about the cow on the moon and, and what that means. So that there's a plan forward. So I'm not just saying, no, the cow's not on the moon and stop lying to me about what you learned in school. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but, you know, we're not. Instead, we're saying, well, what's our plan? Our plan is we're going to think about why a cow might have trouble on the moon and we're going to think about how, and we're going to write it down because you're going to forget otherwise. So we're going to write a note that's not you're in trouble, but rather I'm going to talk more to my teacher about why I'm wondering about the cow on the moon. So teacher can say, oh, you know what? There's a misunderstanding. No, there's not a cow on the moon. And that's a solution approach as opposed to a you're lying to me approach. So how do we take that in a slightly different way and turn it into something that could be a bit more positive uh, for that individual? Ask questions to evaluate comprehension. This again we talked about with language and it comes back here. Again, we always want to check for understanding. Because you can say it doesn't mean you understand it and you may only have a piece of it, you may not have all of it. You might just have gotten a little chunk into your memory and that's coming out but the rest is missing. Again, think about those pictures that, that I showed you where they were, you didn't see that whole gestalt, you didn't see the picture put together. So if they're describing one detail of it, it could sound great. Or if they drew you one detail, that's great. But they didn't have the whole big picture. So sometimes we have to check for the big picture understanding. 
Um, proactive external supports. Um, you know, can we have technology reminders? What other supports are there? You know, there's some lovely assistive technology type things now that sometimes can be helpful to kids to give them ra reminders. And, and I say proactive because it's ideal when we're dealing with memory if our reminders and our systems of support are proactive. Because as soon as we get reactive, right, think about times when you're challenging your memory, like, okay, an exam, that's an easy one, right? We're in an exam and we're stressed. When you get to that question where you don't know the answer and your stress level goes through the roof, you know that moment where you see the question and your stomach drops and, and you're like, oh, I don't know this, and your stress goes through the roof, what happens to your memory? It totally tanks. Like what you did have is gone and the rest of the test gets even harder, right? And that's why we teach stress, you know, test writing strategies that help people manage that stress. So as soon as we're reactive and we're challenging people, their stress level goes up and their memory will go down. This applies to an FASD too. So the more we can be proactive and anticipate areas of difficulty and see it coming ahead of time, the more we can put supports in place so they can maximize memory function that they have as opposed to creating stressful environments where we're being reactive and the memory declines. Reframing expectations. I don't need to expect you to remember quite so many instructions, so I'm gonna give you one instruction at a time or I'm gonna write instructions on the board. That's reframing expectations. Now, so that was kind of an accommodation list, and it's not intended to be exhaustive, and, and I you know, fully expect to get some emails that'll say, oh, here, Jackie, is another one, or here's something you didn't talk about. And, and I love that, because I think that, you know, you guys, I think a lot of times when people are day-to-day, um, -day, you, you're forced to kind of come up with things, and, and that's where creative strategy development really comes. So I, I look forward to hearing some of that. But let me talk about intervention. And, and a large part of intervention is around strategy training. And, and you heard when Carmen was talking about all these groups and all the research that's out of it, a lot of it had some kind of coaching and some kind of strategy training embedded in that. That was key. I mean, that's what we did when we did our rehearsal. And that's something you see generally across the board. And a lot of it is done, you know, even while they're doing another task. So Carmen talked about CogMed or these other systems. We even talked about the digit span, something really simple. So there's really two things happening in these interventions. One of them is practicing a skill set, and one of them is being coached in how to apply a strategy to that skill set. So both are really important parts of, of the formula when we're looking at intervention. It's kind of like, let's imagine I was learning to swing a golf club for my golf swing. You could sit there and say, okay, Jackie, when you swing the golf club, you have to stand a certain way, and, and you could tell me all about it. And I'd go out and I'd try to show, do what you showed me, but I wouldn't do that well because I'm just trying to do it from memory. So just telling somebody a strategy without practicing it doesn't really help. Now, if somebody gave me a golf club and said, okay, Jackie, go figure out a swing, so I'm just doing the activity, I could develop bad habits, I may have no idea what strategies to use, so again, I'm not gonna learn. So what's best is if I'm out there with that golf club practicing my swing with my coach standing right there with me saying, no, no, a little to the left, don't swing your hip, or whatever, I don't golf, so I actually have no idea what they would tell me, but anyway. <laughs> They would tell me things and, and the thing is that my stroke would get better because I'm practicing it and I'm training my brain and my brain is learning by rep repetition, doing it over and over again. That's how brains learn. That's how um, networks in our brain connect and develop um, is by doing something over and over again. And I'm being coached in the way to do it best, in, in strategies and tips and ways to do it. So, Combining those two, and again, Carmen talked about some of the research around these things with other populations, and, and we found it too, seems to be the most robust or the best supported approach. The other thing that Carmen said that I think is really worth repeating is, is the idea of being intentional. We don't always have to do things that are really, really complex. And sometimes with memory, because memory is, again, back to the first quote we started with, so fundamental and core to who we are, we take for granted the strategies and the ways in which um, we manage and work with memory on day to day. We don't realize how often we're rehearsing information day to day. We don't realize that we're chunking or we're organizing or we're doing this because we do it so automatically. And a lot of this d develops automatically with us. And so we're not necessarily as intentional around teaching these things because a lot of us acquired them fairly automatically. And so we're not saying, wait a minute, has anyone ever said, if you whisper these words over and over in your head, it's going to help? And again, with the kids that we worked with, a lot of them, this was brand new. So 
a lot of strategy training comes down to being intentional, comes down to saying, we want to have them engaged in activity and we want to go back to the strategies we're using and be really intentional. And even if it seems really simple, and just because we've done it and we find it really simple, doesn't mean it is. And, and it could still be new. And as Carmen said, we have kids going, wow, what a great idea. I never thought of that at 10 years old. So, you know, you never know. And it doesn't necessarily have to be intensive nine months, you know, 45 minute a day kind of intervention to have an impact and have a difference. One of the things in terms of strategy training, and in, in, you know, Carmen talked about computer programs and, and we've been doing one, a computer training um, program in, in a much broader cognitive realm. And so we didn't want to talk about it today because it's, it's much bigger, but much like the ideas of CogMed and things that, that Carmen talked about looking at um, increasing attention skills. What I did want to tell you about though is in doing these computer, these training, these programs with kids, we have paired them with coaching. And so we have had kids with an FASD doing computer programs much like CogMed or other programs that are intended to improve attention and basic inhibition and basic skills that are fundamental. While they're doing these programs, we've been coaching them in strategies. And, and one of my students has been tracking these strategies and saying, I want to see if kids with an FASD can actually learn strategies and begin to spontaneously use these strategies. So she was saying, you know, I want to say, can we actually teach these strategies? And do I have to be there and cue them every day? Or can they start to do this activity and show me the strategies on their own and acquire some independence over, you know, the course of, um, say, the 10 weeks. It's about 10 weeks that we're working with the kids. So 21 strategies were identified and used by kids with an FASD. 21 different memory strategies or different learning and organizational strategies. That's a lot of strategies, guys a lot of strategies. These kids were able to use them, some more than others, and you'll see on your next page, I've got a huge list. Most children's strategies they were able to use and some of the children used. But all of these strategies were used by kids with an FASD. They were learned on that most children used. They didn't start with these strategies. They didn't come into the program using these strategies. They were coached and trained and practiced and rehearsed and done over and over and over again. There were lots of cues and not reactive but proactive cues. Remember that when you're doing this, you need to remember, you know, you're, you're trying to, you know, um, uh, remember what balls were on the computer screen, for instance. So remember to think about what balls were there. Remember to, you know, how to organize. So directions would be clarified, rehearsal would be reminded, but the kids, the majority of the kids that we worked with demonstrated that they could begin clarifying directions. So they got to the point where they said, I missed that direction. Can you tell me it again? They learned. That's a strategy. That's a huge strategy. Asking for help, recognizing that you don't know. So the interventionists would say, make sure if you don't know what's going on to ask. Make sure if you don't know what's going on to ask. And they did that every week. Make sure, make sure. And then at one point, the kids would start saying, I'm not sure I understand. Could you help me again? Whoa, that was on its own. They were asking and then consistently doing that. Rehearsing, Carmen talked about that. Touching a screen, it's a computer screen. So some of these are obviously specific, but they were learning how to track and how to remember information by using their hands and integrating visual and physical strategies. Um, they were looking at how to non use nonverbal memorization and how to link information back and forth. Um, they were able to use other resources available to them. For instance, they were linking things to stuff in the room and saying, okay, if I look at this, it reminds me of this. These kinds of memory strategies. Um, and I'm not going through them all. And I can, you know, answer questions if there are specific questions. But essentially, and, and these are not necessarily all hardcore strategies that are in some book of strategies to teach. A lot of these strategies were generated by the kids were generated in conversation with the kids. How do you think you could remember this better? Which is another piece of proactive. So if you're working with kids and you're saying, okay, we're struggling with this, or we're trying to remember this, how could you do this better? What would that look like and how do we help? So a lot of times the interventionists would actually work with the kids to identify strategies. So again, I share this because I think it's very exciting and I think what it tells us is that we can teach kids with an FASD, how to use strategies. 
We do see improvement in their performance when we teach strategies. This is exactly what Carmen was saying with the rehearsal. We saw huge improvement, and we're seeing some of that in, in some of the work we're doing here. They are learning new things, and they are applying new things. So we want to accommodate, and we want to support learning as much as we can, but we don't need to ignore the intervention aspect. We can change the way kids use and apply strategies, and we can improve their function directly, as well as accommodating. And if we put these two things together, there's real promise in terms of how kids can perform. So what are we still learning more about intervention, efficacy using scientific, Carmen said this. We're still learning more. We're, we're learning what to do. Um, we're learning more about what folks are doing right now and how we can start capturing that and that's where we started even when we talk about invest and, and these ideas of how do we get information to flow both ways and, and you guys know I've, I've shared this lots before anyone who's seen me but we want information to flow from what we're doing in the, in the lab to the community but we also want it to move from the community up because it can go both ways and there's real wisdom that needs to go in both directions and we all have to put our heads together and the more we can do that, the better, and I think that's something that we're still figuring out how to do best because it's hard, um, but we're, we're exploring it. And, and how do we merge our findings with the larger systems of support? So how do we build things like strategy training? It sounds great. Okay, let's do strategy training. Who's going to do it? How's that going to work in a system? Who's got the time? You know, I've got other things to do. Whose responsibility is this? We heard Carmen say that when we could get caregivers doing some of the strategy training with intervention programs, it was the greatest success because it became part of their every day. It could be cued, it could be reminded, it wasn't just something you were pulled out for, 30 minutes of strategy training and then nobody did anything again. So it's lovely when we can integrate it, but how do we make that really function within a school system? How do we become more intentional about that without you know, creating more load? What would that look like? How would that be feasible within the school system? These are things we need to keep thinking about. Or a home system. I say school, but um, home system, any system. How do, we, how do we make that work? How do we build the homeschool partnerships in a way that maybe what we can do is, is have parents and our caregivers and, and teachers working together on a few key strategies and say we're going to cue and resp you know, support. Let's pick two strategies. Let's pick one strategy. Let's just start with one. Let's pick one strategy and we're both going to work on it from home and school and just remind the, the, the child or the individual um, to use this and work together as a team. How do we do that and how do we make that happen? Staying informed, seeking partnerships, asking questions and seeing the potential and the possibility um, are all really important pieces. This is my, my mantra. I, I say it all the time. And I always invite everybody to email me and, and be part of our electronic newsletter with the um, Canada Research Network and the Intervention Network Action Team because this is one way that we try to keep people connected and share information. We also have access to a blog site where again we invite people um, to be communicating and sharing what they're doing because that's how information gets out. And that's that T with the invest model is that transfer. Um, we could be doing brilliant things but we need to think about how we share it and how we let people know how we're capturing the results of our efforts. And that's enough from me. So I'll, I'll see if there's any questions and as we wrap up. Thanks, Jackie. There are just a couple really good questions. Uh, one is from Sheila in Ontario, and she's asking. Hi, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, is asking uh, specifically on the complex figure task. Yeah. Uh, were children able to discern their drawing that their drawing looked different from the model? Oh, that's a great question. Some of them are, and some of them are not. It, it varies a little bit kid by kid, and, and I've, I've given that, it's, anybody that knows me knows I'm slightly obsessive about that test. I, I really love it. For, as a clinician, I love it, and, and, and so it's become a big part of some of the research. But um, there are certainly kids who recognize it, and there are kids who don't. Um, and the ones who do recognize it have no idea what to do about it. And, and it's quite interesting because they do become quite frustrated. So if they do voice it's different, they'll look at it and they're trying to figure out how to do it, um, you know, and, and trying to match. Their strategies are usually kind of weak, like they'll, you know, sort of maybe put a pencil on here and then bring the pencil over here if they don't, you know, to try to mimic um, a movement. But a lot of them will do it and I'll look and I'll say, because I always say, does that look, you know, like the, the drawing? And they'll go, yep. Yeah. Now, do they, are they saying that because they think it's what they should say? Maybe sometimes, but I do think sometimes they really don't see the difference either. So, but it's a great question because it does kind of relate to 
what they're seeing and how much of it is simply their ability to reproduce it versus their ability to actually see it. And for some, it's an ability to reproduce, but for a lot of them, they're just not seeing it or they're not seeing how to get from one to the other. And they're sure not seeing how it all pieces together. Thanks. Um, here's another question. Um, this person says, you have provided great information, thank you. Thank you. It <laughs> seems that several of the studies showed that having a parent learn how to assist and teach a child about some of these strategies has been very effective. Are there training sessions or information available for a parent to access in order to assist children with FASD? And if so, how do we access that? That's a great question. I don't know of any formal. Now, there are programs, you know, um, certainly support sometimes, um, you know, like mentoring programs, or I'm thinking of places like coaching families mm -hmm. and things like that with Catholic Social Services who provide support to families in a much more general way. Is there anything specific around, you know, strategy or how you help with this? No, um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I see this, though, as a really great opportunity for partnerships between school and families because the memory strategies that we're talking about are not um, new or different than just good strategies. The key is to be intentional in terms of supporting the strategy. And so it would be great for then a caregiver to sit down with a teacher and say, you know, initiate that conversation and say, you know, we're wondering about memory. We're wondering how much this might be. What can we do to help be proactive to help cue their recall more, because we know cueing is better, we know proactive is good, build in some visual concrete, and maybe think about strategies. What could we come up with for a plan for memory? And how will we know if it's working? I always like that, how will we know if it's working? So while there's no training that is formal, I do think that there are informal opportunities for us to build relationships and that that information is there. And I think a lot of teachers know this information well. Um, you know, and I'm always happy to send back emails, and, and I'd love to see us get better at having more training. But yeah, to my knowledge, Carmen, do you know of any? I'm asking Carmen just in case I'm forgetting. There's nothing, is there? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it right now is done within the research world. So it's being part of a study and, and whatnot. But it doesn't, I mean, like the CogMed system, for instance, is out there that um, other people can access. I'm not sure about like how that would work, but again, it, it does cost money as well so it um and I don't know if they provide the the strategy training yeah like if it's yeah yeah I, and I, I mean I think there are also just even again knowing that there are some general resources around strategy training like even just basic books on how to improve your memory and we want to look at very yeah like very, there's definitely basic books and stuff out yeah. there for sure and and yeah. I think those are useful to us like because we're not the kind of things like Carmen said, we're talking about rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Like this is not, a, a, it's about being intentional mm -hmm. and recognizing basic strategies. We're not doing really high level work here. We're doing it at a, at a, a grassroots level. We're doing the basic strategy and we're doing it repetitively over and over again. It's gonna take a long time. Like be prepared to be repetitive mm -hmm. and some days they're gonna show it and some days they're not and be prepared for that. Manage your expectations. <laughs> Um, but there can be change and they can use it. We just have to manage our expectations around that. Great, thanks. Uh, Justin from St. Albert Catholic Schools. Hi, Justin. Has a strategy to share and he's wondering if you can give him any feedback on it. Sure. So he says, I created a goals outcome tracking sheet and I develop it, developed it with the FAS affected student, parents and myself. We develop realistic short and long-term goals, strategies in which to effectively work on the goals, resources that can be accessed both individually or, um, sorry, <laughs> resources that can be accessed both individual or community supports and evidence that the goal has been achieved or not. We all sign the goals sheet as a form of accountability and ownership over the goals created. Lastly, I always encourage the student to pin up the goal sheet in places like his or her bedroom, fridge, or somewhere that can be accessed quickly when needing reminders and questions. Any suggestions for further improvement of this strategy? Okay, first of all, I love it. That's great. And I know a lot of teachers are doing this kind of great stuff, so I love it. 
Um, I think it sounds really great. I like that it's shared. I like that there's a partnership with the kids and the families because I think that's crucial. We, we need to work as a team. I, I think that's so essential. Um, I love that you're you know, clearly defining goals as well as ways you'll know if the goals are achieved. I think that's a really important part. Um, I mean, I, you know, and, and, and was, is, is it Justin? Is that right? I, okay, so yeah, I mean, and, and Justin, I would love to hear what, um, and I know we don't have time now, but at some point, and he, you're welcome to email me, I would love to hear more about what kind of goals you're setting and how you're, eva you know, measuring those outcomes mm -hmm. and then what kind of results you're having. Because it would be great to say these are the kinds of things that you're doing to achieve your goals and this is the kind of success you're having. I would love to hear more about it because that's where we say, well, you're already capturing some of that information. It's useful to the child, it's useful to the family, but we can also make it useful to other teachers and other practitioners out there by saying, hey, here's somebody who's got a great idea, and it sounds like it's something that is doable, not too much of a workload. So thank you, Justin. Um, one last quick question for now. Um, how do kids affected with FASD do on theory of minds tasks? <laughs> Well, you know what, we, we, we sort of know this because, um, and, and I'm looking at Carmen, I don't know if you want to answer it because we've done some work in this area as yeah, well. Yeah, we have one paper on this um, and basically children with FASD did not do very good on theory of mind tests, um, to put it short. Um, so we do have a published paper. Um, if the person would like to email me, I can give them the reference because I, um, yeah. Um, I don't remember the title. But the, yeah. yeah, it's children with FASD have difficulties with theory of mind. So, so they did have a lot of difficulties with theory of mind um, and probably related to underlying difficulties with executive functioning and being able to take an, another person's perspective. So we can definitely distribute that paper because it is published. And as far as I know, it's the only one published on theory of mind, although there's other, um, Truman Coggins has some, um, yeah work he's done in that area as well so people can look at his research just for me as a lay person can you explain what theory of mind oh, okay, is <laughs> sorry um so theory of mind is is the ability to take the perspective of, of another person and under, i understand that a, a person has a has a perspective that may be different from yours mm -hmm. so being able to just understand that their thoughts and beliefs are different than yours and an, another person may have a belief that is um that may not be the correct belief that could be different from yours. So perspective taking, basically. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, and we and we do test um, theory of mind as well. You know, even clinically, it is part of some of the clinical work that we do now with the FASD population, or or um, generally is. Um, challenges with it is it also is very language loaded, so it's very hard to know because sometimes we voice a, a you know understanding of perspective, so that makes creates challenges. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, there does seem to even with um, there's even um, some uh, tests that they do that are very um, play oriented um, with like visual concrete like dolls and characters and things like this to say, you know, if these two know this, does this know what they know and that kind of information. So it is very p assessed in a, in, in a play model. And again, like Carmen said, we do consistently find that the kids just have a hard time putting themselves in somebody else's shoes. Mm -hmm. We just got a really helpful comment in about resources for parents from Great. a speech language pathologist in Saskatoon Great. who says that uh, speech language pathologists in schools have many programs, workbooks, et cetera, that can be copied for parents and teachers that focus on things like auditory skills, memory and sequencing, categorizing associations, following instructions, et cetera. It may be helpful for parents to call their school and ask to speak to, with their speech language pathologist. Mm -hmm. Great idea. That's good. It's great. Yeah, I mean, schools really do have access to a tremendous amount of, of resources around these these pieces. And I think engaging with your uh, child's teacher and with their school and, and the more that partnership is built, um, the more that, you know, you will have access to those resources. So, yeah, I appreciate hearing that. Uh, do you know of any websites where teachers or other professionals can post the strategies they've been using to share with others? Yeah, um, one, well, for sure, one place that they can go is, is if you email me, that we do have a blog site with our Intervention Network Action Team where we, we can create some conversation. There's also um, new, in, very new, started in January, a community of practice, and I wish I could remember the, um, 
web address, but it's an FASD community of practice. So maybe that's even the web address. Is that right, Angie? Do you know? Do you I know don't know, but oh. I bet if they Googled it. Yeah, yeah, and it's very new, um, and there's not yet a teacher spot, but um, I'm doing some work with a few teacher groups right now, and I think we're going to create a teacher spot, a group on there where we start to, to create that community. So again, that's from the University of Lethbridge, um, or you know, affiliated with them. I'm, um, um, but there's been some really great work done on that, and I encourage folks to take a look at that. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's a site that is geared towards relationship building and people connecting with one another. And so I'm hoping to see how we can use that as well to create some groups for teachers. But the blog site is also there as well, and we'll hopefully have everything all linked up soon. We want to link things so it's easy. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Thanks. I think that's what we have time for. Wonderful. Thank you.